Hello, Cell and Genetic Biology, Tuskegee University. This is Dr. Chastity Bradford, and I am continuing Unit 2, Chapter 7, and this is Concept 7.2a. Membrane structure results in selective permeability. What is a membrane? So now you understand what a membrane is. Um, condoms can be considered membranes. They form selective barriers, which means they allow certain things to get through. But most of all, they're used because they prevent viruses, a number of viruses, from entering. Let's discuss membrane proteins and how they function and how this relates to selective permeability. So a membrane is a mosaic, if you recall from the previous lecture, fluid mosaic. It's a collage of a lot of different proteins embedded in this fluid matrix of the lipid bilayer. There are a lot of proteins there, of course. Um, it's a mosaic of proteins. And they determine the membrane's specific functions. And there are different types of cells and the different types of cells that exist, they have different types of proteins. So the cell membrane is a mosaic. There are two main types of membrane proteins. They're peripheral proteins. These are the proteins that are not bound to the surface, that are bound to the surface of the membrane, but not embedded okay, in, in the lipid bilayer. There are also integral proteins, integral. They penetrate the hydrophobic core, and these proteins span the membrane, and they're often called transmembrane proteins. The hydrophobic regions of an integral protein consist of one or more nonpolar amino acids, and they're often coiled into secondary structure called an alpha helix. So there are two types of membrane proteins, peripheral ones, these are the ones that are bound to the surface, and then you have integral ones that are completely, that completely span the membrane of, um, that completely span the transmembrane. So what you see here uh, are the two types of proteins. So depicted here, of course, is our lipid bilayer, phospholipid bilayer. And you have your peripheral proteins that I'm highlighting here. Peripheral proteins, okay? And you also have your integral proteins, integral proteins. And you can see how these integral proteins span the entire membrane. So they're often called transmembrane, so they go through the membrane versus peripheral Anything on the periphery is on the outside or just kind of hanging on the periphery, okay? Attached to the periphery of this membrane, okay? Now, what type of amino acids would have to exist here in the core? I want you now to begin to think about how to build the lectures. How do we build upon that knowledge that we've gained in the previous chapters one through five? Now that we're in chapter seven, how do we build upon? We've learned about the different types of amino acids. So what type of amino acid has to be in these integral proteins? What do these integral proteins have to be composed of? What types of amino acids? Because they reside in this hydrophobic core, they have to be a specific type of amino acid to exist here, correct? That's how you have to think. Now, the other part of this is how then are these membranes, how then are these proteins held in place? And this builds on what we've learned in the previous chapters as well. And so you see how they're held in place by various extracellular matrix proteins, if you recall from the previous lectures, okay? They're held in place, so you see the collagen here. That's an extracellular matrix protein. You see integrins here, one integrin here, okay? Let's begin to build upon what we know 
This is more of the same. Where in the membrane would polar and nonpolar regions reside? If this is our extracellular fluid here, this is our phospholipid bilayer here, okay? Where in the membrane, where in this membrane would you find polar and nonpolar regions? Your nonpolar regions are going to exist within this core. And your polar regions, as seen here, are going to exist near this side of the lipid bilayer, okay? Closer to the phospholipid ends. Now, how then are these proteins synthesized? What dictates uh, where these proteins will end up, whether they're going to be on the inside of the membrane or whether they're going to be on the outside of the membrane? And so now we're continuing to build upon what we know. What do we know? We know that the asymmetrical distribution of proteins, lipids, and carbs in the plasma mem membrane is determined when the membrane is built by the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. So let's put together what we've already learned. So if this is our endoplasmic reticulum here, and you notice that um, budding off of the ER are transport vesicles, and these vesicles have these proteins in them that have been modified. And so in this example, this vesicle contains a transmembrane glycoprotein, okay? And it's making its way to the cis face of the Golgi. And, um, you know, there is also a secretory protein here, okay? That is in a transport vesicle that has made it to the cis face of the Golgi. There is also a glycolipid shown here, and it's made it to the Golgi apparatus as well. And so now these proteins are being modified by the Golgi. And when they're, um, when the modification is complete, we know their destination, they butt off and they exit the trans side of the Golgi. And you see it in transport vesicle. Now you see we have a, um, another, pro you have the proteins here that are ready to go. So now we have a glycolipid here, a transmembrane glycoprotein here, and you have secretory proteins, okay? They're all in this transport vesicle. And so they've all been tagged and now we, we know their final destination, okay? So they're making their way to the membrane, okay? And so now you're having the secretory proteins being secreted like they should. You now have your transmembrane glycoproteins going in, into the membrane and spanning both lipid bilayers. Transmembrane glycoprotein. Okay? It's been modified, so it has a glycoprotein attached to it. And you have a membrane glycolipid. So the glycolipids now end up here, the membrane, as a signaling molecule. And we'll talk more about this. But you have to remember, all of this matters, okay? We have membrane lipids and proteins that are synthesized in the ER. We have carbohydrates that are added to proteins in the ER. Okay? And because of all of this, we end up with our glycolipids highlighted here. We end up with transmembrane glycoproteins. And of course, we have our secretory proteins. Okay? And then when these vesicles begin to fuse with the plasma membrane, as shown here, the outside layer of the vesicle becomes continuous with the inside layer of the plasma membrane. So the outside layer of the vesicle becomes continuous with the inside layer of the plasma membrane. Okay, And in that way, the molecules that originate on the inside face of the ER, they end up on the outside face of the plasma membrane. It's amazing. 
And these membrane proteins have functions. They function in signal transduction, cell-to-cell -cell re recognition, transport, enzymatic activity, intercellular joining, such as gap junctions, and attachment to the cytoskeleton, an extracellular matrix. And we are going to just briefly review two, two of the functions of these membrane proteins, signal transduction and cell-to-cell -cell recognition. You should always be asking the question, so what, why do we care? Why is it important? Signal transduction involves three components. You're going to learn more about this in organismic biology if you take this later on in the spring, the second part of this course. But signal transduction involves reception, transduction, and response. So these membrane proteins are involved in signal transduction. So this is an example of serotonin, okay? Here we're going to call it 5-HT, okay? It mediates mood, how you feel. It dictates how your vessels function, and it dictates GI or gastrointestinal motility, okay? So let's just say we have um, this protein, 5-HT, okay? What is this? You see this alpha helix here <clears throat> representing the secondary structure of a protein. This protein just happens to be a receptor. So this is the 5-HT receptor. So it is receiving the, this is the ligand 5-HT. It's binding to the receptor. So this is the reception part of the signal transduction pathway. Binds to its receptor. It sends a signal. That's the transduction. There's a signal that's transduced, and then we end up with a response. That response being some change in your mood. If it's attached to um, another membrane, a postsynaptic membrane, it affects that membrane's function. Okay. If it's attached to um, a cell membrane in the GI, it affects the way the GI moves. And so you have a res you have reception, transduction, and response, and it's all related to transmembrane proteins. So signal transduction is a function of transmembrane proteins. Another function of transmembrane pro of membrane proteins is cell to cell recognition. Now, um, membrane carbohydrates are involved in cell to cell recognition. So cells, how do cells recognize each other? And, and why is that important? So cells recognize each other by binding to surface molecules. And carbohydrates are often these sur surface molecules that cells recognize on the plasma membrane. <clears throat> For example, this is a plasma membrane that, I, that the, pictorial di the pictorial diagram that you've been shown previously. And this is a gly glycoprotein here. And you see the carbohydrates here in green. Okay, Glycolipid here. So... The membrane carbohydrates play a role in cell-to-cell -cell recognition. Why is this important? Now, if you recall, if a membrane carbohydrate is covalently bonded to a lipid, it is a glycolipid. If a membrane car carbohydrate is covalently bonded to a protein, it's a glycoprotein. Okay? So we have a protein here. We have a carbohydrate attached. It's a glycoprotein. We have a phospholipid here. Okay, we have a lipid here attached to a carbohydrate, and it's a glycolipid. Okay, know these terms. They're in bold. Now, why is this important? I give you. I will give you two examples for why it's important. It's important for immune responses. It's important for blood donations. If I am donating blood, I am O positive. If I'm a blood donor, I can donate blood to someone else that's O positive, check. Someone that's A positive, check. Someone that's B positive can receive my blood and someone that's AB positive can receive it. And I am a blood donor, by the way. Now, the universal blood donors are O negative. They can donate to anyone. Okay. Why is it that I can only donate to four other, one, two, three, four other 
um, blood type groups, if you will. And an O negative person can donate to anyone. What is it? If we're saying that these membrane proteins are important for cell to cell recognition, what is it about the red blood cells membrane proteins that dictates this compatibility? It's oligosaccharides, oligosaccharides. Okay? So, in this diagram, for example, if I'm O positive, there are certain oligosaccharides attached to certain membrane proteins, certain proteins attached to my red blood cells, okay? Certain sugars are attached, and that's represented here, okay, in this figure. You can see the certain sugars that are attached to my red blood cells versus someone else that's A positive, B positive, or AB positive. And so this dictates what the person who receives my blood, how their red blood cells will recognize or respond to my blood. Will it reject it or will they accept it? It's based on what those cells recognize, the oligosaccharides that those cells recognize. Okay. Now, we talked about immune response, how membrane proteins are responsible or important for immune response. So, for example, HIV is not a homosexual disease or virus. Um, it's not, you know, back in the day, they used to only say, actually initially, they would always say that it was just pri primarily um, homosexual Caucasians that were contracting um, this virus, HIV. But we know so much more now, okay, which causes us to be so uh, because we're so much more informed, okay, we can be so much more careful about the actions that one takes. Okay, so what do we know about this immune response? What we know is that it's about whether or not you have a receptor or receptors for which the HIV virus can bind to. And every person on the planet, as far as I know, has these receptors. Some people have more than others and some people have less than others, but it's no longer the disease that just one group of people can, can, can acquire, okay? Anyone who has this receptor and this receptor can contract HIV, okay? So, these receptors are proteins, and they bind, these receptors are proteins, and this virus binds to this receptor, it recognizes it, and it binds to that receptor, okay? And then you'll have some response. So in this example, they're showing you here to the left, that HIV can infect a cell that has a CCR5 receptor on its surface, as in most people. And then they're showing in this other example that it can affect a, cannot infect a cell lacking the CCR5 receptor on its surface. And in these individuals, they're resistant to the infection of HIV. Because studies demonstrate and people believe that you need both receptors, okay, in order for the virus to get into the cell. All right. So we have reviewed the fact that um, both that membrane pro membrane proteins function in signal transduction and cell to cell recognition, and we will cover the other four functions of membrane proteins.